Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. Once again, we're very excited to have the one and only Bill Holter on our podcast. He's been gracious enough to join us again now for a fourth time and hopefully many more to come. Uh, please do like, subscribe, share this so that others can gain the knowledge you're getting. And you can check us out on Telegram, YouTube, and Rumble. Bill, welcome to the podcast. Once again, thanks for your time. John. Appreciate it. Okay, so Bill, I'm going to start right off the bat like I always do. Um, as you know, we talked offline. I heard you a couple weeks ago on uh, Resurrection Sunday on X22, which I thought was a little unusual because he usually does Saturday shows. Um, but he asked you a very specific question, which I had been waiting for somebody of his caliber to ask for many, many years. He asked you uh, later in the portion of the show if you thought there would be a global currency reset of all the currencies. And without hesitation, you said yes. And that would be based on precious metals and various commodities. Um, so my question to you is a two-part question. A rough time frame of when do you see this happening? And are, are there any particular currencies that you have your eye on, like the Iraq dinar, the Vietnamese dong, or is it a combination? I think it's already, it's happening before your eyes. Mm. I mean, you're watching de-dollarization. <clears throat> um, as a matter of fact, I think yesterday it was announced I mean, it's happening. It's happening before your eyes. Uh, the reset that I envision is you're you're going to see uh, really all currencies. Uh, some currencies aren't even going to be the same currencies. I mean, I in my opinion, I don't even think the dollar is going to be the same currency that it is now. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a, a huge. Uh, initially, I believe it will be a man-made reset. And I think markets will see through that and understand that all it is is a blockchain uh, still counting fiat currencies. And then I think once uh, the markets wreak havoc on the fiat currencies, I do believe there will be a Mother Nature made reset. It's going to force, uh, and when I say Mother Nature, I mean, you could look at the BRICS as being part of Mother Nature. And I'm saying this because really all they want is free, fair, free and fair trade settlement. Mm -hmm. So they're going to come forward with currencies that have some type of backing, whether it be gold, whether it be oil uh, or other commodities. I mean, you could even have grains, although grains, obviously, you know, you can't store them for years and years and years. Um but for initial backing or for, for short-term backing for a currency, um, anything can back a currency if it's desirable. So I, I just I think the reset is happening already, and we've got a tumultuous uh, probably at least five years ahead of us. Hmm. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Um, speaking of that, actually, speaking of the uh, the international markets. That's another thing that's good follow up for us, Bill, is looking at the 10 year bond yield and uh, just an interesting, just one perspective anyway, is Cliff High's data sets, he's looking at about a 10% drop in the bond market. It doesn't look like the feds, it doesn't look like the feds are going to be able to stop it this time. If, if um, they'll try, but if they're not successful, what implications does that have for gold, oil, and silver and the currencies you were just talking about? Um, the better question is, what implication does that have for the dollar? Because, I mean, you're talking about, remember, oil doesn't go up and down. Gold doesn't go up and down. Silver doesn't go up and down. I mean, an ounce of gold is an ounce of gold, whether it's an ounce of gold today or 100 years ago or 100 years from now. It's still just an ounce of gold. The way it's it's measured, it's measured in currencies. And... The Federal Reserve has talked about lowering rates and now they're kind of backpedaling on it. And I think they realize if they do begin to lower rates, they're basically giving a giving the dollar at the top of a children's slide just a little bit of a nudge and it's all downhill from there. So I think, uh, I, I and I was on the record, I think back in November, December, and, and you know people have continually asked me uh, because that was when I think back in October was when the uh, interest rates peaked just over five percent and started coming down. They got down to three seventy-five, and it's my view 
that left alone, yields will rise. And the reason I say yields will rise, because I mean, just look at what inflation is now, even though they say, you know, it's much lower than it was, you're still looking at three, 4% inflation. If you have a, a 4% 10 year treasury, there's no uh, risk adjusted premium there. So the yield's gotta be higher. And if you, if you then look under the hood and you find out that the issuer itself is insolvent and whether you talk about the treasury or you talk about the federal reserve, they're both basically insolvent. I mean, the treasury, there's no way, there's no way that bonds could be serviced or paid back on tax dollars alone. The only way they've kept this game going is by increasing deficits. And if the world says, hey, no more, we're not buying any more bonds. And during that process, they've been in that process. That's going to leave the Federal Reserve another insolvent entity. And that one, I mean, is, is kind of blatantly insolvent. They lost, what, $165 billion last year. And the last I saw, they only had $65 billion in uh, net equity going into 2023. So they completely wiped out their equity. Um, so what I'm getting at is there, I believe yields are going to go higher. Uh, if yields get to, if the if the uh, 10 year gets to and through 5%, then you're going to see what real fear is. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, that's when, that's why I was asking that. Cause I think that's, uh, once we hit that point, it's really any man's guess as to how high or low it will go. Um, on the backs of that, uh, Bill, I heard Mike Maloney the other day recently talking about gold going five to seven doesn't seven, five to seven times doesn't necessarily mean that gold is rising in price, but that the value of the dollar is being lost in purchasing power, as you just talked about. That sounds right to some degree, um, but would you also think that gold's price has been unfairly suppressed over the years, at least in the first increase of gold? Uh, could it just be gold's rising to a price where its true value has been all along, or is it just the market adjusting to the true price? Well, governments, and obviously the U.S. government, has tinkered with gold's price for as long as you've been alive. Um, and actually, I mean, you could go back to the 1930s when they revalued gold higher from $20.67 to $35. That was arbitrary and that was man-made and that was, you know, that was not, that was not market forces. Um, gold and silver have been suppressed for years with the sale of naked uh, paper contracts, whether it be on COMEX or LBMA. And it's my view that what's coming is a giant margin call, a margin call of everything, of anything and everything credit. And in, in almost all assets, whether it be real estate, stocks, bonds, what have you, that leverage has been used to make the purchases of, of some of these assets. And that's why you see prices where they are. In gold and silver, it's the opposite. The leverage is to the short side. So when there's a margin call, a systemic, system-wide margin call, there's going to be forced buying of the shorts in gold and silver. There is no telling anybody who tells you, uh, you know, gold's going to go to such and such a price or silver's going to go to such and such a price is completely full of shit because nobody knows. There's, there's no, I mean, just take it in dollar terms, for example. The U.S. says that they have 8,300 tons of gold. It hasn't been audited since 1956. So we don't truly know how much gold the U.S. has. And we certainly have no idea how much more debt, how much more money supply they're going to create. So you don't have a numerator. You don't have a denominator. But you want to come up with an answer. How do you do that? You can't. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, Bill, just pivoting on to another point that you had touched on with X22, and you also talked with us on our last show about this. So I wanted to kind of see your, your opinion to date. Um, you had said that you felt that there would be a greater than 50-50 or greater than 50% chance that there won't be an election this year. Do you still feel that way? And if you do, how do you see it playing out? Um, well, if, if we don't have an election, it will be because of some type of 
false flag. Or you, I mean, it could even be a real event, but it just seems to me that the powers that are, are the, the powers that be that are, are pulling the levers right now, they can't cheat enough to win. And if they realize that they can't win under any circumstance, what do you do? You got to do something to cancel the election. Um, and I mean, these polling numbers that are, are coming out, uh, I think, along with every other bit of information that you get is it's bullshit. I mean, they're 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 made up numbers. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, I think it there's certainly better than a 50 50 chance that we don't have an election, in my opinion. And I still get to have an opinion in the United States for the time being mm. until they completely cancel out the Constitution. And actually, while we're on that topic, look what they just did. Look what they just did with the spying bill. I mean, that that eradicates what is it, the Fourth Amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, that's... That particular bill should be put in front of the Supreme Court, but who knows how they would even rule on it or if they would even rule on it. And then the other thing is what they do. They they come up with another $90 billion to send to Iraq, to send to Israel, um, to send to Taiwan, but not a single dollar to, to close our border. You've got... Uh, <clears throat> In, in a, a true and just world, all these people would be um, indicted on, on treasonous, you know, on, on grounds of treason. Yeah. Yeah. And be watch, it'd be interesting to see how that all plays out as well in the coming weeks and months ahead. Uh, Bill, for many years, the uh, central banks around the world have been loading up on gold, as you know. But now you're starting to see Eastern countries buy massive amounts of silver, like China and India. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, India, what was it, 130, 130 million ounces is what they imported, I think, just last month. Hmm. Um, or that might be for the quarter, but it's a huge number. I think annualized, it works out to something like 20 or 25 percent global production. That's India, and, and they're importing more than they ever, ever have. And that's just all of a sudden, boom, you know, like a lightning flash. And there's also news that last uh, Wednesday or Thursday, I believe, uh, China announced to their, or, or suggested to their citizens to buy silver because it's so cheap in relation to gold. So what's that, 1.3 billion people? If everybody bought one ounce, there wouldn't, I mean, that would more than clean up a year's global production. And silver is already in a structural deficit. Uh, the Silver Institute, if you look at their numbers, they have, uh, they have fudged numbers. I mean, they changed numbers without even saying that they changed numbers. Uh, they had almost, they had very, very little of demand for, uh, for solar. And solar is like 200, 300 million ounces per year. So we're already in a structural deficit. It's only going to get worse. The, the mine supply is not growing. We're actually a little bit lower than we were four or five years ago. Um, silver is going to be gold on steroids. Silver, in my opinion, uh, versus, versus currencies, silver is going to be the number one performing asset. I would agree because it's just on manufacturing alone, it, it, it drives all of that. So you're absolutely, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there's some concern amongst Americans about the CBDC. Uh, it's been tried and failed and tried and failed. And it's, you know, several countries like Jamaica and China, for example, come to mind. Um, it's my belief that will also fail, fail here in the U.S. as well. Uh, understanding that by virtue of having a digital dollar does nothing to lessen our country's massive debt. What are your thoughts on that? Right, that's what I mentioned before. Uh, you could do a blockchain, and you could you could follow every dollar, and all that does basically is it allows the government to spy on every stick of chewing gum that you buy. I mean, they will know everything you do, but does it solve any problems? No. You still have uh, <laughs> the way the way I've described it is 
you're you're you've got bogus currencies and even if you do a perfect accounting of them they're still bogus currencies the currencies are still going to lose value and we're still going to have hyperinflation so i i agree i don't think uh the cbdc's are going to fly that's your man made attempted reset that's going to fail and then we'll have a real reset yeah yeah i think you're right so I guess with all that said, Bill, you're looking at all the suppression or the attempted, well, the the attempted and illusory um, uh, suppression of gold and silver uh, that's been going on, as you know, for far too long. How much longer do you think they can actually hold down gold and silver for it? It just goes absolutely parabolic. Oh, that's an easy answer. Until the day of a failure to deliver. Mm. The day that there's a failure to deliver, gold and silver will in short order, become unobtainable for fiat. You'll always be able to sell or trade gold for silver, or silver for gold. You'll always be able to trade real stuff for gold or for silver. But gold and silver are going to go into hiding from fiat currencies. In other words, no amount of fiat currency. People aren't going to give up their gold or their silver at some point in time for a fiat currency and the reason being i mean how many fiat currencies have blown up in 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 the past and they got zeroed out so you end up holding you gave away an ounce of gold or an ounce of silver or a barrel of oil or loaf of bread or whatever you gave something real away and ultimately your uh your the currency that you accepted goes to zero and actually uh, when I use the term zero, what's the opposite of zero? Infinity. Infinity. Unobtainable. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I remember we talked about that on one of our very first shows. I'm glad you said that, Bill, because i um, noticing an interesting trend. I'm sure you have as well that Wells Fargo reported recently that uh, uh, roughly 200, uh, I think it was a $200 million in sales and Costco of, of gold. And I'm not sure what it is in silver. Would that indicate to you that people are waking up enough in time or is it kind of just a last ditch effort at the door before this thing happens? Uh, well, it was made available to the public and a lot of the public, a lot of people know something's wrong, but they don't have a clue what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's human nature when, some, when, when during bad times, and I mean, this goes back, you know, Couple, you know, thousands of years actually. When when times get bad, people want to um, get defensive, and it's it. No matter how much uh, propaganda and suppression is done with gold and silver, man understands that gold and silver are safe havens. So I, I think because it was offered to them and it was easy, you know, people picked up, uh, you know, an ounce of gold or or well, I, th I don't remember what the maximum is. I think it's 40 ounces of silver or something like that. Okay. So these are all small trades. These are not, you know, this isn't, isn't, you know, big money with, with a small amount of orders. It's a bunch of orders and all small money, but it added up to 200 million. And I think that was just for the month, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think so. that's right. I think it was over the course of a month. Yeah. That's, that's $2.4 billion a year. You know, now, now you're talking money. Yeah. Not to mention what, as you know, every time somebody buys an ounce of silver, what it does to the bank's balance sheets as well. So it has a multiple, multiple effect. Um, Bill, you were a stockbroker for many years and you had a front row seat to the uh, brokerage and banking system. I'm sure uh, that you saw obviously quite a lot of things in your day and trends come and go. Um, can you tell our viewers a little bit what you saw specifically over that time that made you want to decouple from that life and get more into the gold and silver space? Oh yeah, that's, that's pretty easy. Um, I think I had mentioned to you once before that the first book I read in, in college was an economics book and the first page, on the first page it said, we don't know why the great depression happened but we do know it can never happen again. And at 18 years old, I had enough common sense to say that's completely wrong. And it set me off on a, on a journey 
to find out what the truth was, and it led to too much credit. Uh, as far as being, uh, and I built one of the largest retail uh, gold, silver, and mining positions in the country for, for stockbrokers. Uh, I was a branch manager from 94 to 2006 when I retired, and it was my decision in two, early 2006 to step down as branch manager. And I stepped down because what I saw coming was 2007, 2008. Um, it, what I missed there was that the central banks and, and treasuries would blow up their balance sheets to try to save the system. I didn't think they would do that. Uh, I didn't think they would ruin their balance sheets. But the, the reason I, I walked away from the business is as a branch manager, I'm on the hook for every single broker's trade in my office. So I had gone 23 years in the business as a broker, 12 of those as a branch manager. I never had a lawsuit. I never had an arbitration. I never had a settlement. And neither did my office or any of my brokers in the office ever have a lawsuit, settlement, or arbitration. Basically, what I did was I got out prior to things falling apart and lawsuits going left and right because I didn't want to be part of it. Uh, and I mean, if you think about it, in today's world, or even back in 2006, in that world, it was a, pretty much an impossibility to go 23 years without any type of disciplinary uh, arbitration, settlement, whatever. It's It was almost an impossibility. And that was, uh, that's the proudest moment of, of my career is to go through business, do business right, and not, you know, get into legal entanglements. And it, as a branch manager, you know, I can't tell brokers, uh, you know, you should, you can't tell brokers, you can tell brokers you can't do something if it's, if it's shady or, or not legal. But, you know, brokers, people have different views. And my view was the system was coming down. My view was you needed to own gold and silver. Uh, so that was my view. But, you know, other brokers had, you know, didn't want anything to do with gold, didn't want anything to do with being defensive. But yet I was on the hook for their trades as their supervisor. So I just decided to get out of the business. Okay. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Um, it's funny you mentioned, Bill, the longstanding history of silver uh, and its his historical value and preservation. Because as you were sharing that earlier, I was thinking about uh, the days when a Roman soldier was paid the equivalent of 4.6 ounces of silver as, as uh, wages for their service. It was obviously enough money to feed and clothe their family and pay all their bills. Um, that standard remained for many, many years until you know the recent past. It seems to me that we may be returning that to that place again where four ounces of silver may be enough to feed and clothe your family and take care of all your overhead. Uh, what, just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Um, actually, that was probably true uh, when they had the 16 to 1 ratio for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it comes out, silver comes out of the ground 10 ounces for every one ounce of gold. But silver was discounted hundreds of years ago, maybe a thousand years ago, because you had to transport 10 times as much silver as you did gold to transport the same amount of capital. So man discounted it to 16 to 1. Um, then along came what was it, the 1870s, 1880s, where there was a big, if you want to call it a financial fight between East and West. The East wanted uh, gold as money and the West wanted silver and the East won. I mean, both, both were, were uh, both continued to be uh, monies, but that was the beginning of the war on silver, the beginning of the devaluation of silver. So to see it rise, I think we're, what are we, 85, 86 to one right now. And we'd gotten up to 120 to one. Those numbers are, are absurd. And I just think that, yeah, I, I do believe that silver is going to come back into the system 
and the ratio that's 84, 5, 6 to 1 now is going to be a minimum 40 to 1 and probably closer to 21, 20 to 1. I mean, you've got people running around, and I don't agree with it, but you've got people running around saying that they think silver is going to become more valuable than gold. And I don't see that as even a, a possibility, but you know, there are those out there that are talking about that. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Appreciate that. It's funny you mentioned... Yeah. It's funny you mentioned East West because I remember one of our first conversations, and I agree with you that you talked about what we're seeing as an East West reset, and it seems like we're we're seeing it trend that way continually. East, the East and West was Eastern United States and Western United States. Right. Correct. Now today, the the reset is going to be between the West, the U.S., um, Britain, France, Australia, you know, Western mm -hmm. nations versus the East. China, uh, Russia, Asia, mm -hmm. India. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's the two different, two different East West. No, I no, I understand it, it totally. It was it was within the country, now it's within the globe. But still, that thought of the East West predominating, but on a larger scale. To your point, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yep. Um, usually, typically, Bill, as you know, is after a country defaults on their their fiat based system, like the Weimar and French governments come to mind, there's a revolution or a vacuum of power that's leading to some type of totalitarian or nationalistic replacement. Um, is that what you're expecting after the U.S. defaults on the debt? And do you see, uh, do you see, what, what do you, I should say, what do you see happening after the fall? Uh, complete chaos. And I mean, if I told you I even had a, a vision or, or thought process as to how it's all going to play out. I really don't know. I don't think anybody does. Mm. I, there's too many variables. Um, who's in power in the, who's got their finger next to the, the red button in the U S when we fail? Is it somebody with that's, that's has some sanity or is it a, a lunatic that just wants to kick the whole table over, press the button and launch nuclear weapons? I have no idea. Um, I, I I would hope that that's not the case, but as far as, uh, I, I guess the one thing I could say is that Americans slash Westerners, their standard of living will drop drastically and it's gonna take at least one, maybe two generations for that to be you know smoothed out and brought back. Probably not to where we are right now, but brought back to some comfort some type of stability of any type yeah right exactly yeah okay thank you appreciate that last question for today bill just to respect your time um when you're not researching and traveling and speaking like this about gold and silver and just the state of the u.s and global economy uh just for our viewers uh curiosity and for myself i was just wondering you know what kind of hobbies you have because you seem to be kind of a, you know a man's man i was just wondering what you like to do for fun or recreation uh, I used to play a lot of golf. Um, I, for years and years, I played golf. Uh, in 2010, after I moved from uh, from the U.S. to Costa Rica, I was the number one ranked uh, senior golfer. I turned 50 in, in 2010. Mm. So I played a ton of golf, and I really haven't played too much golf in the last couple of years. Um, really, I mean, I go to the gym. Uh, I ride a horse. I had a horse until last July who died. He died and colic and died. But I put on over 20,000 miles on that horse. And the final five years, he never had a saddle or a bit in his mouth. I rode bareback with a hackamore. Um, so, I mean, I rode three to five miles a day. Um, I got a, a, a couple dogs, uh, security dogs. And uh, I, I had, was running, you know, I, I run them with the horse. I ride a uh, exotic game ranch and it's, it's, they're, they're, the two dogs are, are pretty well lined out now. Um, it's pretty important. They don't kill an animal because they've got some, you know, ten twenty thousand dollars animals that they need to stay off. Of. But yeah, I mean, that's my exercise. It's exercise for the horse, exercise for the dogs. So that's, that's my passion is writing. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that, Bill. Um, so any, as we're coming to you in this show, as always, where can people find out about your work and any last thoughts that you have for today? 
Um, yeah, you can go to my, my website. It's just about a year old now. It's billholter.com, very easy. Um, there is a contact button there. Um, if you want to contact me directly, if you're looking to buy or, or sell precious metal, that's what I do. Uh, you can go to my, my business email is B H O L T E R at proton.me. Um, I guess my last piece of advice is just, just keep preparing, uh, keep trying to find holes in what your plan is because I don't think we're going to get a whole lot. We might get a week, two weeks. We might not have any notice whatsoever to the light switch being flipped and the world changing. I mean, we just went through an event with uh, Israel and Iran mm -hmm. firing at each other. And uh, I mean, you could have woken up any morning to find out that something really bad happened and it's all out war. And the world will change like that. Yeah. So very, 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 very just true. Just do your best and 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 you know keep keep trying to expand your your preparations. Great. Good advice. Uh, thanks, Bill, for joining us. We always appreciate having you on the podcast. Look forward to seeing you again soon. And uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, John. Pleasure. Take care.